The Pedalboard Power Cable Kit gives any player the freedom to custom fit their pedal chain with up to six premium quality power cables. Plug in, power up, and play. Chris Keith Ward from your guitar hangout in Nashville's Canary Ballroom with John and Gina of Baroness. How are you guys doing? Uh, we're doing pretty well today. Really good? Yeah. Yeah. They are slammed, so if we seem like we're talking fast, it's not your computer, it is just us trying to get this in before they do yet another in-store performance for uh, Gold and Gray, which is congratulations. Thank another you. phenomenal record. Yeah. Thank you guys. And uh, that's enough of that intro. Let's talk guitars. Let's, Let's talk, it. John. Talk to me. What's your, what is your main guitar currently on tour that you use? Well, I wouldn't say that I have a main guitar, first of all. I'm okay. one of those people. I've been collecting guitars for a long time. You have. Uh, and I've accumulated quite an army of them. So in the past, I've usually, I've usually swapped, subbed in and out guitars that I'm more or less familiar with because I, like I do actually like to keep things kind of difficult. Like, yeah. I don't like to fall too much in love with my guitars, but I currently have actually fall, just falling in love with most of the instruments that we play. So uh, most nights this will be, or no, that's this, hold on. This is uh, the jazz master that I'm favoring currently. Uh, so we picked up with Fender a couple years ago uh, after being with GNL for a while, mm -hmm. after being with Yamaha for a while, after playing Gibsons for a while. And I think o over the course of the history of this band, like. I've just noticed, I noticed more and more and more that when we were in studio environments, we, we would favor uh, single coil pickup guitars and more the Fender style setups to mm -hmm. record. Whereas while we were live, we were doing, you know, like big, huge, full stacks and lots of, you yeah. know, like a lot, lots of humbucker guitars. I thought that was a kind of a stale sound after a while. I thought it was a weird disconnect in between what we were doing in the studio and what we were doing on stage. And I could hear the difference, I could feel the difference in expression. So when we, when we, when we finally got set up with uh, Fender, uh, this would be a couple years ago, for, for me personally, I felt like I'd finally found an instrument that was as expressive as I needed and as precise and surgical a tool in the studio environment as I, as I required. Uh, and you know, that, that said, like a jazz master's got a pretty specific sound, yes. right? There's not, there's like, you know, there's a little trick where you roll off the volume and you can kind of make it sound like another Fender, but yep. really like, when it's all cranked, like all three pickup selections are pretty much very jazz matcher sounding. Uh, so in some ways it's kind of, you know, and that's kind of like a difficult sound. If you're playing technical music, you're playing music that's got lots of riffs in it, lots of, you know, lots of like changes and everything like that. It was sort of difficult at first to manage how the guitar would uh, respond to that. But I think over time we've really, you know, we've really figured out that it, in fact, some of those difficulties are what makes, the, you know, these guitars, this, this brand of guitars, but this sound of guitars also, so important and so special to what you know to our sound. So, what do you enjoy about the P90s in that versus uh, you know like a Telecaster with more standard single coils? Well, well these, these ones, ones just kind of have like this weird resonant like frequency response. It's just it's just odd. It's something you got to like. It is something you got to like handle. The like V mod that they put in the American Pros are like I think they're like overwhelmed, so they like respond a lot better to okay. like hotter output pedals and stuff like that. I play like. A similar one for, I don't use it as like a main guitar, I use it for like low tune stuff. Okay. Um, so like when you break out your lower tuned guitar, like I'll kind of look and see what pickup selector he's using at the moment. Like typically if we're doing a solo like Isaac or like some harmonized like dual solo thing, I'll like flip it up to like the neck pickup if you're like doing a bridge pickup yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, because I, I think the neck pickups on the, on the American Pro like, Jazz Masters. It's really, it's, really unique, it's like, yeah. It's, it's like a beautiful, it's like super musical. It sustains enough there because it's a jazz master. Because the, the pickup, yeah, probably because the pickups are overwound, the attack of your string is more pronounced on a neck pickup than you would typically find. Uh, but yeah. it's also got that you know sort of rounded over, like sort of uh, low passed sort of mm -hmm. like neck pickup sound, what which, which I find is really sweet for solos, even though it seems kind of counterintuitive that you would like back off on your bite. Yeah, solo. And, and you had mentioned harmonized solos obviously with Isaac, but to bring it full circle with the Golden Grey just being released, Borderlines is a song that has like harmonized solos. Are totally. you guys doing that similar uh, speaking 
with with the jazz masters and the same pickups, or are you guys that going one? different? Depends. We play kind of. It's kind of like different guitars on different nights. This is kind of like. I was say, is it, uh, is it a thing that you guys know? This song, this guitar, is it kind of night to night so, thing? Some of them, some of them, are, some of them really prefer certain guitar setups. But this, is, and then this is like the other. Uh, this is like what Gene and I typically play. Uh, yep. You know. Uh, matching Stratocaster and Telecaster. It's also very American odd to see you hold a Stratocaster. <laughs> like, <laughs> just because it's uh, not a guitar I, f I find. I know, Whether it's the first this, axe, the Les Pauls, this even kind of like is my main guitar. GNLs, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it's always kind of more the T style or the Les Paul single cut. So it, it, it's, it's refreshing, but it's also jarring. Yeah, this, the, I, w I would say, like, probably above all the other guitars, this is, this is my primary instrument at this point. I think on Golden Gray. I probably play this uh, more than any other wow. instrument, honestly. Yeah. And on stage, it, it seems that way too. I mean, not not just because, not for any specific reason, but you know, we've got five five ways pickup selector, which was mm -hmm. like five, and they're, and they're you know each one of them has a very 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 unique tone to it. So I've got like several different options, and, and that I mean, think it's just like yeah, like when win. I joined the band, I was like primarily playing just like humbucker yeah like kind of just like shredder guitars yeah like had a kramer sm1s like floyd rose duncan distortions like had the which are um, great yeah mm -hmm. still awesome instruments totally yeah um had a couple like jacksons through the years and stuff like that but um yeah and when i joined baroness i was like this seems like inappropriate for <laughs> like the sound we're going for and when i joined john and i were just kind of like Totally just like geeking out on gear and stuff. You had a bunch of like GNL Tellys at the house, a yeah. bunch of A sets and stuff. And like right before I joined, I found this used um, A set classic. It's like a 92. And so this was like my main one for a long time. Like first joining the band and like throughout the record. Um, they said I just found it used. Somebody popped like one of the N3 Fender like noiseless pickups in there, like whoever previously owned it. Um, but this has like a super, super fat neck uh, pickup sound as well. But yeah, just like I always wanted a telly and John was playing tellies and I was like, I think this is probably a good opportunity to, <laughs> to change up like what I'm mm -hmm. using because, you know, I don't want to come with this like shark tooth inlay. Like, was that super, something you were you using know? with like Miss Talico or was it something where those types of guitars also used with your, with your stint with Cirque du Soleil? Uh, both, just like original bands I've had through the years, like yeah, doing Metallica stuff like at Cirque. Uh, we had like a custom guitar there that had a uh, like a flamethrower built oh, wow. into it, <laughs> and uh, just like part of the production of the show. But yeah. that was like modeled like identically after a Kramer SM1. Like all the specs were were uh, like of the, okay. the solid mahogany Kramer. Um, but yeah, so I got this one, joined the band, and then John and I were like, I don't know, you had a Princeton at the house and like the Champ. A little Fender Champ. Mm -hmm. I think you were playing like Vase at the time too. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, had like a moved, bunch of like moved over to like ten to eighteen watt uh, combo amps. Yeah, I, m I remember back. I saw you guys in two thousand six, seven, eight, nine. We were using big Bad Cat full stacks, yeah. in, yeah. in, in conjunction with those aforementioned uh, humbucker guitars. What took you down the path to lead you to the lower wattage amps and where you're at today? I mean, I, I think it's. It's it's easier to like speak in analogies when I'm when I'm talking about when I'm just like talking about that. I mean, for for me, the big amps uh, and the guitars that are designed for big amps specifically, because let's face it, like a full stack suits the humbucker guitar, Absolutely. right? Or the or rather, excuse me, I think a humbucker guitar was designed specifically to suit the you know the growing wattage in amplifiers at the time when yeah. you know when those were invented. So. From the you know from a f like a fundamental s or from a foundational standpoint like playing the loud stuff with you know the gear that allows the loud stuff you've already you know it felt to me like as if we've already like we'd already made these decisions that just like boxed us into a corner where it also happens to look cool you know it, there's like a swagger that comes along with it yeah and you know I think something that Baroness has always made an effort to try to do is to sort of thwart or question the status quo so maybe at the beginning of my uh foray into changing you know from the more traditional loud setup to a i guess like a more bluesy sort of country yeah setup was just because big because you you go out you could go out and see you know six shows in a week if everybody's got the same gear everybody pretty much sounds the same i mean there's like especially at loud volume yeah and that's the other thing is i i, I come to a, a more realistic understanding of how volume makes an impression on people and how the, the, the illusion of tone that volume gives, right? Because we all, you know, of course, we, as guitar players, we always talk about tone and, 
You know, it's like this unending discussion. Yeah. Well, when you turn up, when you turn something up that loud, if you can hear what's, if you can hear the difference between the notes, then people are, are generally going to assume that, that the tone is good. It's whereas I come to think that maybe it's just volume. You know what I mean? Yeah. And as our stages grew and we became more dependent on on the sound of our PA, I started to realize that it wasn't necessarily the volume that was creating the tone. It was the volume that was masking the maybe some of the inefficiencies of the tone, like the fact that sometimes the sound would be boxy or muddy or, in, or, or inarticulate. And I feel like when I, want it, when I want my sound to go completely haywire and when I want it to be complete noise, that should be a decision that I make, not something <laughs> that's built, you know, hardwired into all the, all yeah. the equipment that I use. So in my mind, playing, uh, playing music with a Gibson through a Marshall full stack is more an equivalent to being uh, a blacksmith using a sledgehammer whereas using uh, these more Fender style guitars or literally Fender guitars, a Stratocaster, a Princeton and a Deluxe on stage is more like using a scalpel and you know being a neurosurgeon so it's just a matter in how we're expressing ourselves if we want to be if we want those elements of precision if we want those elements of like very fine-tuned detailed uh, expression then these are these this is a better setup if we just you know, if it's just about like the rock and roll attitude, yeah, maybe maybe Gibson and Gibson full stack is like a better thing, but I don't know. It sounds that shit sounds awesome there. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying I'm saying a Gibson and a full stack sounds great, but it doesn't sound unique to me. Yeah, you know, it's like is you sound you, like you sound like ACDC, you sound like Zeppelin. Would you say it's like more expressive, allowing yourself to have such a greater dynamic range? Because not that I have a oscilloscope, but a humbucker through a loud stack, like you're saying that, cranked up, probably has squished dynamics mm -hmm. in the it lack is, of to be able to loud. Very little, very little dynamics. Yeah. The further like, you turn up, the less dynamics you get. You know, everything so comes out the same. There's you know? a lot more expressiveness you can have through the instruments that you guys are using yeah, now. Like the touch that we can, the touch that we're able to apply on these guitars is, I mean, it's almost daunting. It's almost daunting when you make that switch to realize how exposed you've become. But through that exposure, you know, it's sort of driven us to become better, uh, I, in my opinion, better, better musicians, better songwriters, and there's less to hide behind, uh, you know, on stage and, and elsewhere. And, uh, you know, another additional thing was we, we moved our rigs over from more like a mono sound to a, to a true yeah. stereo sound. <clears throat> and in order to do that, you need headroom. And in order to have headroom, you know, you need space between your notes, and this is better suited for that. And this, you know, really, at this point, I'm just, explaining a decision that was made, you know, three al almost three albums ago, yeah. just to make our band sound better and more unique. So, uh, you know, at this point, it's, it's hard to say that we could even accomplish any of, any of our newer material from the past couple of records on those, on the, you know, with, with the more old-fashioned Baroness rigs. Understandable. And what's this war looking at here? I uh, just popped this out. You were talking about, like, the humbuckers. At the beginning yeah. of this tour, we had this, like, Tele Deluxe, which <coughs> originally came with the, like, Tim Shawbuckers. Okay. Uh, they're, like, made it. And those are probably Fender stock. Shawbuckers or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we popped them out for these, like, Duncan distortion kind of things. They are, they're Duncan distortions that you had in, like, an old guild. Yeah. I mean, we, like, swapped them oh, out. SB 300? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that real funny shape. Yeah. 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 The really ugly brown <laughs> guitar. Um, yeah, like, it's, this sounds awesome on its own. And, like, the first night of this tour, I was, like, playing this. Because, like, the neck profile on this just feels so good. But having, like these humbuckers through this setup with his guitar, I was like, I can't even hear myself. Yeah, like it, it just, was it really shocking and like really? kind of disappointing. So I was like, I really wanted to like bust this out on this tour. Yeah. Like, but yeah, so yeah there's a, just, thing, a thing where you, where you get like, you get, you fill up the frequency spectrum too much with your guitar and you're not allowing, you know, it, I also think that get like a Gibson and a full stack is fantastic for a three piece. You know, yeah, or, yeah. or if you've only got one guitar player, like you filling up a room, but Gene and I, Gene and I have to play together, so yeah. harmoniously, what you know, what works best for us is to have limited bandwidth. You know what I mean? And you guys play together, but not exactly. You're not you're not going note for note replication of what's being a played. So like, of, yeah. so yeah. like it's slightly off, almost a little disorienting, but still mm -hmm. like cohesive. And so you need probably that that bandwidth to so people can pick up on that. Yeah. Otherwise, it just yeah. sounds like oh, they're doubling. Like the right. majority of what we play is like harmonized and or finger picked yeah. like so you really need that articulation and when I first joined the band I was like messing around with like lower wattage amps at home and stuff like that I had like small Buddha combo like some lower wattage PV stuff and like John had a bunch of like low wattage like Fender stuff and we just kind of got into this thing because we both have the G2 the gig rig G2 yeah, like looper systems 
and we were like, what if like one of us had like a black face Princeton, one of us had a silver face Princeton, and like somebody had a silver face Deluxe, and then you have a black face Deluxe, and we so just- You really thought it like, out that much about well, the amps we had, we had working. At this, at this point, you know, I mean, I think the original decisions were all made based on like what works. Yeah. You know, like yeah. We, we can say all this stuff, but like really like, you can only get, you can, it's only, it's very easy to look back at things retro, retroactively, you know, from a technical standpoint and say, this is why I think this works and this is why I think this works. Yeah. But when you're on stage and you've got, you've got a crowd in front of you, you get like very good bullshit detector right in front of you. <laughs> yeah. And then we have to hear each other. And so yeah. like, it was a, it was a process of refining and figuring things out on stage, what works on the stage, what works in the studio, what, what, what do microphones like, you know, and that, cause that's a part of it because we're, you know, I think as much as anything, this band is, this band takes a great amount of care and consideration into the engineering and production of both our live show and our recorded output. So we've considered all of these things, you know, as we've gone, as we've developed greater sense of engineering and production uh, understanding, both in live and in recording environments, we've been able to adapt our rigs in such a way that it benefits both, you know what I mean? Was there a, st was there a same similar conversation or kind of, a, I guess, alchemy getting to the end result of having the stereo setups in, in terms of like trying it out and Definitely. maybe one of you guys having it first and like we should both be stereo. I think the first show I played with with these guys, we had already established that. was already that. kind yeah, of very, yeah. Yeah. I didn't cake. like come into, yeah, the first show I played was like Princeton in a deluxe and uh, we were able to like AB like mics and stuff like that on them at John's house, like leading up to like me starting to tour with them and, mm -hmm. and all that. but. Yeah, I mean, right from the get-go, it was like, let's do this. And there was a lot of drawings of like, all right, you take the silver face, like Princeton, take black face deluxe, and like all, and all that stuff. And um, yeah, I, I don't think uh, there was even a rehearsal where I was like d doing something <laughs> different. We just yeah. like, we we're like, this is gonna be awesome. It's gonna like look really cool. It's gonna sound great. And I don't know. Yeah, and I think co consequently, like we've gotten to the point where like, at, like literally every feature of our of our stage show is the net result of multiple decisions with trial and errors and it always changes like every tour some details changes because we're we are we are already an ambitious hard working professional band and you guys are we want to improve things and you know? you're also an organism that evolves based on what you hear right. see yeah. feedback and the crowds and so and cool. so what you know i think what's happened over the years is you know in an if in an effort to initially just not to sound like the status quo, we've made enough decisions now where I feel that we've, we are dangerously close, if not having already discovered uh, a, a unique way of presenting the type, not the genre of music that we play or the style of music that we play uh, through what I believe is a relatively unique signal chain. Yeah. Well, I was telling Perry on the way over here about how how the, the album sounds if someone heard it without being a guitar door because I, I, I read your interviews where you both quote uh, this is an album where our music should be for listeners and if they're not guitar dorks they're not going to maybe possibly know that this is a Fender going through this and these pedals but you can hear the Fender quality through that and there's a lot more clarity through this and is that why you've gone through this painstaking to reproduce that on stage is this the closest representation of what you guys use in the studio to what is conveyed on the stage level? I mean, I so. yeah, what yeah. I have up here is... Is that what you guys kind of Pretty much with? what I recorded with, like, for the exception yeah. of... I did use the, the G&L fair amount, and... Uh, I, think you, but I think you use a jazz master and a whammy pedal. On I use a jazz master a lot, yeah. Um, and, like, you know, as opposed to, like, the Princeton Deluxe exclusively, like, Dave Fridman had, like, a really nice twin up at the studio, and, like... Um, I think it was a champ that we recorded the um, front towards enemy, like dueling oh, solo yeah, yeah. on. We had it like uh, a Fender champ at the end of a hallway with like oh, wow. a '57 in the hallway or something, and just like cranked it. And like I think I stood in back? like the kitchen. No, I think we did uh, okay. uh, definitely tourniquet and probably and definitely borderlines. I was going to ask about borderlines. That's a, yeah. that's, that's a really I was curious. I mean, we can get to that with the pedal stuff, but I was curious about how you guys negotiated that solo because it does interweave and there are two parts that I'm sure you guys play live together. We insisted that the solo be tracked like start to finish with us tracking at the same time standing back to back. Wow. Almost every solo is live. Almost every solo is live, at least live between her, she and I. Like yeah. it's so easy. It's, it has become so easy 
to go into like solo mode and go, I'm gonna get my part perfect. You're and gonna get your part gonna, perfect. Yeah. And everything's gonna line up. And that's, you know, that's the sound of like, you know, many, many Varina songs. Yeah. But I think we realized we were like good enough to, to take that, take a step and just, you know, not, on, not only like get the energy of something that was a little bit more uh, painstaking because we both, we both like, we have to we have to live like you know it's, it's a solo so every f every little bit of finesse and every little nuance is is recorded and 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 then rebroadcast on the album so if we're doing something live uh, or, or you know if we're tracking simultaneously and using like and being really uh, uh, you know all about the integrity of that take that means one of us might have to forgive uh, you know a little error or like a lack of nuance in favor of, so, you know, like my, the if I just like yeah. flop something, but Gina's, you know, Gina had like the energy that carried through and just didn't, you know, was yeah. more important than mine. And then that's, you know, that's what we went with. We didn't go for like technically precise, just get every single note exactly where it needs to be. I don't think that, I don't, I don't think historically that's done anybody any favor. No. It just puts like a cool intention behind what you're recording and like yeah. putting out there. And like, I, know, I always hope that that like shines through. It's yeah. like the intention is like, does. Me and my buddy are gonna like do jam. This and like, yeah, yeah. We're, we're just we're just ripping and, <laughs> yeah. and like you know you're like seventy five percent of the way through something like a solo or any like specific part on this record. If we're doing it simultaneously, it's like, oh god, we got this far. Okay. Yeah, it puts like a <laughs> certain <laughs> amount of like accountability on you to like, oh, I don't want to like screw him up finish. or I don't want just like it. yeah. Um, but you know, the, the, here's the other thing I think is really important to notice or to note is that while we are extremely uh, critical thinkers and uh, you know we're, we apply a, a very heavy doses of analysis to the music that we've written and to the music that we've recorded and, and as we're playing it. When you're in an, a studio environment where anything's possible, you're limited only by the, you know, the extent of your creativity, you, could, you can spend all day getting something to you know, fall right on the grid if you, if you want to. Yeah. But we had some, we had some, probably, it was probably a mixture of like the density of the material that we were uh, recording the technical bizarreness of what we were doing, the, the you know the Byzantine labyrinthine quality of the way that she and I have like come to play pretty simple chord progressions, uh, there was something about that that led us to a, a, a state of recording existence where we didn't we couldn't really think back too hard. It's yeah, like, ah, it yeah. sounds fucked up and distorted and raw and weird, but okay, let's go. Go next thing. You yeah, know, next thing. Mm -hmm. like, we're always always moving on to the next thing, and you know you couldn't really think back too long and hard about anything because there's a lot of tracks and there's a lot of parts and there's a lot of pieces so um you know so th so th 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 it is, there is like this balance that i've always felt that we have to maintain in this in, you know throughout the career of this band which is one between the layering detail embellishing you know perfectionist you know pursuit of pursuit of some kind of chaotic perfection yeah and then you know which 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 means you have to be regimented which means you have to be somewhat organized which means you have to do you do have to check and make sure that you're you know not inverting chords or, or that you're intentionally inverting chords that you're aware of that but also you know we also have to make sure that we don't overthink anything yeah because it sounds like it sounds but first half of this interview like it sounds like we overthink everything it sounds like we think a lot about it that's sort of like the second step the first step is like you gotta feel it you yeah know, it's got to be a cool idea it's got to be a good idea it's got to be something that you know feels weird and fresh and sort of frightening and then you chase it, chase it, chase it till you're at the end of it, and then you listen back, and if it's cool, cool. You know, who that's cares what at it the is. end result, who that's cares, all that matters. What it is, you know? Gina, do you think coming in at the end of the Purple Cycle and touring with the guys, I know you did a bunch of like festival dates in 2018, do you think that enabled you to really feel ingratiated with the other guys and when it came to helping contribute and be part of a full member versus sometimes in the, the way that band's life cycles go is that someone gets inserted right at the recording process? Sure. You were able to be a part of a band and then really feel at home and like what John's probably saying is being able to communicate and talk whether it's you know verbally communicate but also just guitar playing ways. Yeah I mean John and I spend and spent through that whole process like a tremendous amount of time together like specifically in John's basement yeah. where <laughs> majority of the gear just like lives and where gear discussions happen. Yeah yes. and we were able to do stuff like we were talking about earlier like plan out our rigs and like map everything out and you know we toured quite a bit before we actually started like really going heavy on writing yeah. and like demoing stuff and then like by the time we got to the studio I definitely felt really at home with 
Sebastian and Nick and you know John and I had just played guitar so much together and yeah having that touring experience makes you feel like all right cool I'm in this yeah yeah now, I mean that's know? that's like the only way you know the only way any of our albums are ever going to get written is if we're writing as a team yeah and you can't I, I think I think especially in this band I, I should preface by saying I don't have the experience of playing in any other bands <laughs> yeah okay so I don't really know how other people do it but I have learned over the years you know having gone through so many lineup changes that the only way that you're likely to feel confident as a group and as a unit and as a family in a in a writing rehearsal recording and then touring environment is if everybody's you know everybody's up to speed and the best way to get everybody up to speed is to tour because touring is not touring's like where you take these songs with incredible complexity and detail and subtlety and you have to learn when to let go of that and you have to learn when to like rein it in yeah uh, because playing our songs live is different than playing them in the studio you know sometimes you have to sometimes you have to just throw caution to the wind and you really have to beat your instrument up um, in order to get the right energy out of it but sometimes you do have to play the right notes so it's, it's <laughs> a really a it's a really the dynamic change on stage is really intense whereas in the studio you can you you don't need to always be like switching from like 11 to 0 and 11 to 0 yeah. and 11 to 0 all the time cool well i feel that this has been a good discussion and down here Let's move on stage so we can uh, see some pedals. We're on stage now. We're talking to John first about his pedal board. John, take it away. Just kind of walk me through everything and... Uh, <laughs> I'll try to walk you through everything. No, briefly explain how you use this spaceship. Uh, so I, I'm not really sure when I found this guy or when I was hipped to this, but uh, there's a company out of England called uh, Gig Rig and they make this unit called the G2, which is a... It's a loop. It's a looping system, uh, whereby I have ten individual loops uh, listed here, and fourteen banks or fourteen channels and presets per bank. I can set things up so that I have bypassed all. You'll see as I scroll through the loops that certain lights will turn on and off. But uh, you know, I said I have. Uh, I think we have eight banks. Uh, in this unit, which means 8 times 14 plus a hidden preset, 8 times 15 potential sounds uh, throughout the course of a set. It's, it uses MIDI, it has two stereo channels at the end, so there's really, and, and uh, it's, it's a huge buffering system. It has a pre-gain and a post-gain. It has an individual uh, tuner output and an individual volume, an assignable volume pedal output, so I can put the volume pedal in between uh, any two loops that I like to get the effects that I desire. Uh, so I basically have set up uh, more or less one type of effect per, per 10 loops. Did uh, you do this yourself? Yeah, so everything's, everything that Gene and I have is hand-wired. Okay. We developed the schematic ourselves, we wired it ourselves, uh, we use custom lava cables that we cut ourselves, uh, and both of our pedal boards include pedals that uh, I've designed yeah. and sell. So, With Philly Fuzz, yeah. yeah. So you know, I think that I think that as complex as this looks, you know, it's the the interesting thing about it and the the one of the most fun things about it is that it is so, you know, th when you're looking at mine, when you're looking at Gina's, you're looking at something that we built by hand uh, and we designed to suit our needs specifically. That said they it does follow like sort of standard protocol for uh, pedal um, ordering. Uh, so for instance when you know, I have a bank switch here, which will light up and give me these eight blinking lights. Okay. Any one of those banks is going to have the the fourteen presets plus the fifteenth, which is hidden. So let's say I choose I'm on uh, bank one, uh, patch one, which is my clean. Nothing's on. I've just got a little pre gain and post gain set so that I reach unity, and it's <laughs> out of tune, but sounds great. <laughs> because, I don't know if you can hear this, but because the buffering is so robust, it really accents and highlights the sound of each pickup in the guitar. Now, I just go through, I'm just gonna run through this first bank of mine, uh, which is, if I'm, if I'm lost in a set, I just use this one because I know it the best. But my, my second thing, which you'll notice some of these have orange lights on those. These are designated as stomp box mode, which means I press that and it adds a pedal in. Oh. I press it again, it takes it out. Gotcha. Some of them are just presets, like the distortion will switch everything over to a distorted channel. So go. But I, if I want to add compression, if I want to add a low drive,
off. Uh, if I want to add in my, I call it analog delay here, but it really is just a digital delay three. I switch out my delays pretty frequently. Uh, then my reverb patch has both my reverb, uh, but it's also, this thing also does a little delay, so I'll cut that down. Okay, so there's my reverb, but it also happens to have my Digitech whammy in it, which doesn't make any sense to put a whammy and a uh, reverb in the same spot. Just ran out of space, so. <laughs> And now is that like something you use Digitech or the, the whammy for like the Ula, like the Ula, that solo? Yeah, with a little bit more heat on it, but okay. then, you know, so then I've got my main distortion, which is uh, the first channel in a double hot cake, followed by, at cur this current moment, a, an MXR super badass. <laughs> And then I've got, oh, and incidentally, by double tapping any one of the non-standard, or one of the presets will put me into my hidden bank preset, which I just have designated as the tuner. So now I'm tuning uh, when I'm in between. My crush setting is the setting that has my uh, infidel fuzz on it. So it's a little wilder sounding. Here's uh, regular distortion. Here's crush. Then I have solo, which is usually a blend of uh, a couple distortions and a delay. I really didn't mean to squeal that one. That was a mistake on my part. Sorry, I did. The intentional little... squeal is always welcome. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, then the, 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 I'm going to try to move really quick here now. The interesting thing about having uh, this two stereo loops at the end is that I can I can actually engage in some fairly creative uh, using the MIDI and using the Strymon Mobius, which is the modulation effects and the Strymon timeline, which is my uh, big digital delay. I can I can do a different I could do a different combination of chorus, flanger, phaser, tremolo, and digital delay, multi delay, dual delay, reverse delay, whatever. I can do a different setting each time I step on a bank. So here's my clean channel with a, like a phaser added. Or, and that phaser is set to full stereo, so the phase is actually moving back and forth in between my two. Um, and then I'll, I'll, if I add uh, my timeline in, this one, oh, this one's not that interesting. So if I move it to bank two, I got some cool stuff there. This is a patch that I use for when we're playing uh, green theme. It's got, a pretty, oh. it's got a pretty wide, huge stereo delay on it and a little bit of compression, or a lot of compression, rather. So. <laughs> That's that's there's that's a cool use of the 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 uh, stereo function. Uh, and, pat, and my patch bay three has got. Um, uh, let's see, I use this one in a song from Purple called "Wake Up." This has got a, delay, a stereo delay on it, doing uh, like a pattern delay out of different pattern out of each amp, and it's got a the Mobius is set to rotary, which has which also has a stereo feature, which kind of has like the horn and the bass driver set to uh, the different amps. But this doesn't sound like the patch, even though it is. which has kind of like an ice thing on the beginning of it. Yeah. So as you can see, there's, there's, there are almost unlimited ways to, ch to shape and sculpt the sound so that, we can cr so that we can effectively turn these guitars into synthesizers or things that sound nothing like the six string instruments that they are if we choose to. But then, we, of course, we've got all these like settings uh, that work with specific songs. So uh, you know, we're able to, we, we're able to have some some amount of predictability each night when we play some of the songs that have a little bit more soundscapiness to them. Uh, and 
you know, I, I think for somebody like me who's really OCD but also really chaotic and a real mess, uh, having something that helps organize my confusion a little bit more has been a, a really great thing for me. Uh, also, the fact that I like, I, I enjoy the capability of making something, designing something very specifically for each song, but then also having the throw caution to the wind attitude and being able to just kind of like make it up as I go along. So those are some of the more like so, sort of like standard stock sounds, I guess you could say that, that that I've got. But there's some, I guess there's some that are pretty bizarre. Well, I was just saying, just to put a bow on this, what would you say currently, right now? I'm asking you, is your favorite patch? Uh, I think the one I go to a lot is, um, well, I like that Eula patch. I like that thing that's got the little, uh, the high bits on it. Yeah. Um, but let's see. Uh, there's, hold on, I want to find one here. Which one do I really like? Oh, yeah. Uh, for the solo and feud, I've got, you know, we, we're, cut, we're doing this real chill thing, you know, chill thing. There's a lot of clean guitars, and then there's like this sort of Leslie sound uh, solo that I use. And while Gina plays like the world's most insanely dry sound and they work r really well together with it. <laughs> Just, I like having the capability of making, you know, sort of getting a, like a Leslie vibe in there. But I, I also, you know, I just really, I really do enjoy shit like this. Where things just sort of modulate and go in and out. Oh no, that one doesn't, not doing so much of the, the like sort of ice effect on it. But so, you know, there's, there's a lot of, we play around a lot with octaves. So uh, we also, you know, there'll be, there's certain patches that I have. Where I can add a pog into it. Uh, and stuff like that is, again, like why I find the Fender so interesting because you can't really do that with the uh, Gibson as much. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't really have a favorite. I just like them all and they change all the time and I like to Fair keep. Fair enough. I like to keep things moving. I like to keep it difficult <laughs> for myself. I like to make sure I'm doing this plenty of times during the set. And nothing ever goes exactly right. There hasn't been one perfect show ever with me switching in between these. So all this help, and I'm still kind of screwed on stage. But I like that. John, thank you so much. We're going to talk yeah, to Gina real quick. All right, last but definitely not least, we're here with Gina. Most importantly, we're here with her pedal board. <laughs> Gina, walk me through what's going on and just show us uh, some key sounds that you have to dial sure. up each night. Yeah. Uh, I'm also using the uh, Gig Rig G2 like looper system that um, John and I wired uh, both of our pedal boards together. and. Yeah, like he was saying earlier, we have like the lava cables that just come on this giant spool that we like measured out, cut, stripped, put the you Arts know tips on, yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> we actually did it at like John's kitchen table together. Like, all right, ready? <laughs> Here we go. Um, I don't know if you can see from there, but I have a uh, 68 Princeton reverb, uh, 65 Deluxe reverb, and the uh, the uh, Deluxe is running through a supersonic 212 uh, extension cab. Gotcha. And then all of that is coming out into here so they can run in stereo through the uh, the gig rig system. And kind of like John was saying, it's just like your standard order of events as far as pedals go. I have this uh, little SP exotic uh, compressor first. It's kind of like a Ross compressor kind of thing. Um, it's got a couple pots on the bottom that you can like set the attack and release and um, it's got like a pad and stuff like that So it's pretty cool um, That's going into the Wampler Tumnus, which is like kind of like a clon uh, Kind of pedal it's much got, cheaper version. Yes, definitely <laughs> and smaller too. Yeah, and then that is in the same low gain loop with uh, this fettle boost This is another uh, local Philadelphia pedal maker uh, called champion Lessie Hmm. And uh, this is a really cool, just like treble boost uh, pedal, kind of show it to you. Um, I love the artwork with all the underpants. All the underpants, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's just it's it's got two gain stages in here. Uh, the first one is just like a unison uh, unison transistor. It's like you know makes your tone break up just a little bit. The second one, which he calls the Clart. Um, switches it into like a bipolar transistor, kind of like an LPB1 uh, pickup booster, okay. that kind of thing. And then it's got a high pass so you can like clean up some of the lows and stuff like that. So this is a really neat pedal, I'll kind of show it to you here. So same thing like John kind of explained like the stomp box mode versus like the actual individual presets on mm -hmm. G2. I have a low gain setting, same as him. 
So that's running the Tumnus, and then I'll switch on the Fettle Boost for certain solos, like in um, little things, for example, like it's not a super fuzzed out solo, but I just like getting the little bit of extra like gain that, that this pedal offers. Uh -huh. so. This is just the uh, Tumnus. without the uh, the clart so it's, it's just pretty <laughs> it's pretty heavy it doesn't have any clipping diodes or anything either so the high pass really helps with that um, next is my just regular distortion I just have the uh, MXR super badass which everybody always like shits all over I think it's awesome I mean it's super badass it's, it's super badass <laughs> maybe, you shouldn't, maybe you should cut that part out I don't know. <laughs> but no I love it it's just got you know three band EQ I run my high gain setting on G2 with the Tumnus running before it. And then with the uh, buffer system that they have here, you can kind of gain up the signal that you're feeding into the pedal here oh. with the pregain. Um, if you just hold it down, it'll set it uh, to unison, but you can like add a little bit of heat going into the pedal. And then likewise wow. on the post gain, you can add more or less heat coming out. So I could take away a little bit of the signal feeding into the pedal and just boost the volume without affecting the tone and that kind of thing. So it does give you a lot more options when you're like shaping these specific settings and uh, and that's for each individual patch. So if I want more gain feeding into a certain pedal in one sound and then want to use that pedal again, I can like individually set that so it's not like, you know, re repeated throughout. Just, you know, depends on what song. That makes everything a lot more flexible. Totally. Especially using this versus maybe another switcher unit. So clearly, Daniel, Gig Rig, and the, that pedal show, just to give a shout out, they know they what they're it. doing. Yeah, they're red. Good dudes. Um, my fuzz, I also have the uh, Infidel fuzz, the newest like Philly fuzz pedal that's, that uh, our buddy Steve is making. This is the prototype. Um, it's, just, it's a super cool like zippery fuzz. Where does it sit with the germanium or silicon? This is a germanium okay. uh, transistor fuzz pedal. Um, like I, I was telling you earlier, the Heretic, the first one that they made is really like kind of a 60s fuzz. It's like very defined fuzz that you're getting. It's like very specific. This one is just like, wild fuzz out of the box and then you can kind of dial in the highs and mids and stuff like that. It's got a sustain too, which I really like. Um, so Here's a bad boy. Like a, this is a solo patch. Super zippery. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Velcro, I love that. Yeah, totally. Uh, I don't like having it set like super high. I try to just use it as like a tone shift as opposed to like a boost. Yeah. But, and Philly Fuzz is really good for that. Like you can shape them and you know, you're not getting like this wildly different, like, whoa, now it's a solo. It's just like, oh cool, <laughs> now it's a different tone. And you know, especially for all the harmonized, like dueling solo stuff that, that checks out really well for us. And to give another shout out, the Philly Fuzz is what kind of brought you and John together. That's true, yeah. I bought one online and Steve, the dude making them in Philly, I guess maybe sent a message to John, John sent a message to me, like, yo, you buy this pedal? And I was like, yeah, dude. And he was like, we should <laughs> jam, damn. we should check it out. I was and like, now look at oh my God, yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Um, next I have the uh, MXR Phase 90. Um, I just have it taped down so it's like the slowest, uh, you know, the slowest rotation of, of the phase, which I really like. Where does uh, that get brought up in the set? Um, a lot of times during, like, Shock Me. Okay. I was gonna say, a lot of times during the set, specifically during Shock, Shock Me, Me, like right before the uh, solo, I like clicking this bad boy on with the Disaster Transport. It's like a modulated reverb, or modulated delay and reverb that you can kind of blend the two together. So that is... <laughs> Like I just took off in a Challenger. Totally, <laughs> like a spaceship, man. Yeah, John, John was like even like coming over to this side of the stage during like that part and shocked me, and I, I'm always yelling at him like outer space sounds, <laughs> um, lasers. 
Yeah, my analog delay uh, patch, right now I have the disaster transport, but I change it out pretty often. Sometimes it's a DD6, sometimes it's the space spiral that uh, Earthquaker makes. We have a whole song on Golden Gray that's like pretty much written around that pedal. Oh, really? It's what just song? Like a, uh, it's called Pale Sun. Okay. That song on the record. Um, and that's that's all of these. What else? I have, uh, I'm using the Strymon timeline through the like MIDI. Which is a powerhouse. On the, on the G2, yeah. So I really like that for big stereo sounds. Pedal. This is a very unmusical pedal. In untrusted pedal. hands. You just feed it like your signal and you set like the corresponding subharmonic that uh -huh. you want to go with the signal you're feeding it. It just takes your like original like thing that you're feeding into it and turns it into like a huge square, like fuzz square wave. And then it's it kind of makes your guitar to this like triple voiced guitar synthesizer. Um, you can set like the oscillation and like what intervals you want it to oscillate at. Um, it's completely insane. We use it in the set. We started we use it a lot on the record, but we started using it in the set as like part part of like interludes and stuff yeah. like that because we have so many like interludes on the album. Mm -hmm. It's this thing we started developing for the live show, and Seb started doing this thing called Drums of Doom, where he's just like hitting the toms with mallets, and I just use it for like noise <laughs> like kind of going out of there. Um, God, where is that? Here it is. And then that's set with like a, a downward filter on the, uh, on the Strymon, so it, it'll just do this all day. This kind of destruction sound. And the last thing I, I gotta ask, and we'll end on this note, is that I've read that John knows that you have the sweet spot for a whammy, and here it is. This so is it, yeah. Can you, can you explain? Yeah, I use this a lot throughout the set. In, um, in Seasons, there's a really cool patch that's kind of this like, um, it's just like a swelling delay that the time it takes to like regenerate, you have to um, kind of keep up this like really frantic rhythm. Mm -hmm. And song on the record it's kind of this like whammy setting that's in between like the two octave settings it just gives you like a really cool like chorus effect Down even with like a little bit of heat on it, I think it's got like a cool. It's almost like you're tuning it as you're pushing down. You're hearing that sweet spot. And yeah, I can yeah, hear totally. it like line up. Yeah, and there's a lot of times when we do it live, I have to like get down and like tap it either a little bit sharp or flat, just yeah. so it like lays right in there in the middle there. I think it has like a cool 80s metal like 
sound when it's got some heat oh, on yeah. it. It's got like a weird bad brains thing when it's like clean and just like weird coursey sound. But yeah. Awesome. Well, Gina, John off camera, thank you guys so much. Thank you, man. Yeah, of course. This is Chris oh, yeah. Keys for Premier Guitar.